welcome everybody to another episode of the Awakening Your Health Potential podcast. Today I have Lawrence Achike, who is a two-time Olympian at the Sydney Olympics and the Beijing Olympics for triple jump. And he also was the British team captain for the World Champions Championships in 2009. So welcome and thank you for having this conversation with me today. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure. So I wanted to talk to you today. Number one in this time is is so perfect that we have been able to connect because it's also Olympics time. So I thought it would be a nice tribute to have to, you know, have, have a chat to you about like triple jump and how you got into it. And then we'll kind of take the conversation into a couple of different directions. So how did you get into triple jump? Um, very much at school. Uh, I did a range of different sports, uh, varying from rugby, athletics, uh, football, uh, loved them all. But really athletics was the one where I felt uh, I had the most fun. Uh, as for actually the event, the triple jump, it's almost the event picks you rather than you picking the event. Uh, I expect at sort of the schoolboy age, I was a sprinter and a jumper. So I did the 100 metres, the 200 long jump and triple jump. Uh, and as I my career, it was clear to see that there were a couple of events that I was really good at, which was the long jump and the triple jump. And uh, I represented Great Britain as a junior athlete in both those, long jump and triple jump. And so when I got into the senior ranks, I was only really good enough in the triple jump to sort of make that sort of world-class uh, level. So I ended up becoming a triple jumper. Wow. So in what was your, what was your best jump? Your furthest jump? Uh, my furthest jump ever was 17 metres and 30 centimetres. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I sometimes probably... look at it now and I just don't know how I even got out that far. It's just, it does seem like a long way when, you th- when, I, when I look at it now. Oh, totally. How long have you been retired for? Oh, goodness me. Um should be easy enough to work out. I retired in 2012. So yeah, eight years now retired. Wow. Okay. That's a fairly long time. And have you missed, do you miss like being an elite athlete and having all your energy kind of spent in that area? I think initially I did a lot. Uh, So probably for the first two years or so, um, I was definitely umming and ahhing about if I could do another year, could I go back? Uh, And it was really hard because, uh, doing it for so many years I think I was an international athlete for about 20 years wow. uh, and so sort of, uh, having not having that focus of either world champs or an Olympics or a Commonwealth Games to focus on uh, was really difficult so um, the first year when I stopped it was extremely difficult just even having a structured day uh, because it was all so structured before to try and achieve what we we were doing that uh, it seemed so alien to me not having that kind of structure in place. So you had kind of, you you got really good at setting like long-term, long-term goals and then like what you needed to do like in this, in the smaller medium term to achieve them constantly. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. We had these training cycles. So the overall cycles of four year cycle, which would take you from one Olympic games to the next Olympic games. In between that, you had a couple of shorter cycles, which would take you between the two world championships that sat in between the two Olympic Games, and then other cycles for Commonwealth Games. And you could even break it down to your winter and summer cycle, where you do your preparation for the summer, preparation for the winter. So there were loads of cycles all entwined into this big sort of universe that led you towards your next Olympic Games. Wow. So, Larry, we were just trying to work out when we originally met and we think it was like maybe, what did you say, about 2005? Technically 2005, yes. I think I was, it was sort of my second stint out in Australia. So, yeah, I, I think that was it. And so did your coach come with you or did you like have a, a bit of a team approach with, with other coaches? So I was very lucky. So uh, my coach who uh, coached me for, goodness me, it's got to have been 20, no, just under 20 years, I think about 18 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, He came out with me the first year uh, that I came out to train here, which was like the the night, it was sort of end of 97, 98. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and a very good friend of his, who was also a British Olympian, uh, was living out here. His name is Keith Connor. He actually ended up being a uh, head coach of Australia at one stage. Wow. Uh, so he was an Olympic triple jumper as well. Oh, he wow. got a bronze medal in one of the Olympics. So, uh, 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 so Keith and my coach Frank were very good friends. They grew up together, and um, Frank introduced me to Keith. So while I was out in Australia, Keith was doing a lot of my my coaching and sort of mentoring, and I'd go back home and sort of rejoin Frank and he would get me ready for my competition phase of my season. So I was extremely lucky to have two coaches of such high standard uh, watching and oversee my training for so many years. I, I feel very fortunate to have been in that position. And what, would, what was the benefit of like coming out to Australia? Was it the escaping the winter? Oh, very much so. Uh, <laughs> you know me well. I hate the cold. I cannot stand uh, the cold winter weather. It's very unpredictable, as you can imagine, the weather in the UK. So uh, being able to come out to a climate that was warm for so much of the year and got quite consistent summers made a huge difference in the way I could plan my training. So uh, planning is so critical. You want to be able to set sessions on certain days and be able to deliver them. Uh, in the UK, I mean, when I first started, we didn't have very many indoor facilities. So it just meant that you could get called out by a rainy week, which would mean you'd, it would set you back uh, a week on your training. You'd have to find a way of sort of regaining that. But coming out to Australia, um, that was a huge benefit having the weather. Uh, also, I was very lucky in the sense uh, I had a couple of training partners out here who were also of Olympic standard. Um, I trained with a couple of Australian Olympians, uh, Andrew Murphy and uh, Peter Burge. And so it was really good sort of training with them and sort of they sort of helped keep me up uh, and um, keep me up with the standard of training. And it was good because we had a good sort of friendship and we also were rivals. So we all competed against each other which is a great environment to be in. Yeah, totally. And, you know, like we all know that at, when you're at that really, really high level, like the amount that's in what who comes first and who comes fifth is very, very, very small. So yep. apart from your, like, physical attributes, which obviously, you know, you had the right technique, you had great skill, you had a good training program, you would, your diet would have been good, um, what what are, what are the mental aspects that you think like kept you up there for you know like a twenty years is a, a huge amount of time to be an Olympic athlete with Did you have many injuries? Oh, I did. I did have my fair share of injuries. Um, but I expect on the mental side, uh, I loved competing uh, in every sport I did, any activity. Uh, I think you, even if you ask any of my friends now, I think there's there's never a sport I play that I just play to play the sport. Uh, we kind of play to win all the time. And um, that for me drove me. It was what kept me really sharp and always wanting to be the best out there. So I think it's all that sort of mental drive of always wanting to win. And it, it, um, I mean, it, sometimes I'm probably not the best person to be hanging around with when I'm in that phase because I am very single-minded and I, I go out there to try and achieve what I've set my goals at. But, um, but what you found is that it allowed me to prepare myself for, for major championships like the World Champs and the Olympics. And um, it definitely benefited me in the sense that I know that there were a lot of people who'd beat me throughout the season and come to the Olympic Games or the World Championships when it came to the qualifying. They just wouldn't cut it on the day and the pressure would get to them. Whereas I was quite lucky in the sense that I used to arrive, I just used to thrive in the pressure. The more pressure the situation, the better I seemed to perform. And um, it was never something that worried me. I, I'd never get nervous on the day. Uh, I was always nervous the day before. So sleeping the night before was never easy for me. But on the day, it was, I just couldn't wait to get out there and jump. And um, I think that definitely did help me uh, throughout my whole career. So interesting. So you reckon it was literally winning was the, what you focused on? Definitely. Uh, so it never I crept in like, what if I don't win? Like that, the other side of that never crept in. That was never, ever an option. Uh, wow. I think uh, sometimes the, just the level of training, I, I remember because sometimes I'd have to do part of the winter in the UK and uh, 
literally you're waking up at 5 30 in the morning you're going for a run it's snowing it's freezing cold you just don't want to be out there and as you can imagine the uk around about that time is pitch black and so it's dark and i'm um, sometimes i'll be i'll find myself sort of jogging around um shopping malls because uh, not necessarily in the inside but just in the car park so i'd have at least the light so i could run and when you're doing stuff like that you're only thinking of one thing is that this is going to pay off come the summer. This is going to be worth me getting up this early, going through all of this. I think if it wasn't for the aspect of competition and and going out there and trying to be the best in the world, I just don't think I would have been able to get out and uh, bed and do that. And I suspect another aspect would be the fact that you mentioned earlier, my injuries, I, I got quite a few injuries throughout my career. Um, And what I found is all about how you manage those injuries uh, if you end up having a decent season or not. So um, pretty much most athletes will pick up some kind of injury throughout sort of the winter preparation into the summer. And it's all about how do you manage that till you get to that main point where you have to compete. And um, and yeah, those sort of driving forces of want to make that major championships, go out there and try and get a medal. I think those are the things that sort of kept me sort of driven to uh, keep on working at it. Wow. So you could, like, that focus on winning could, like, l- let you drop any other things that were kind of bothering you? Very much so. And do you I, think that that's what other people would crumble in? Like, they would just let the other stuff, like the mind chatter, jump in and take away their focus? So it's hard. I mean, um, I found that probably the easiest period of training for me was actually uh, coming out to Australia and doing six months in Australia because you just didn't have the distractions. I I was away from home. I was away from family. So you don't have all those other pressures, all those other distractions, people relying on you. So actually coming out to Australia was good for me because you kind of cut those ties. Everyone knew you were away for six months and then you had to focus. I never based myself in the city when I was over here. Well, I did actually one year, but that wasn't really by choice. Uh, but a lot of the time I'd sort of base myself out at the northern beaches. So to get into the city and see some of my friends who were around was actually a bit of a chore. So uh, it, little aspects like that actually set me up and it, it just allowed me to stay a lot more focused. So uh, I look back on it and, uh, yeah, there were there were large periods of time where I would be pretty much training by myself and sort of getting up day by day, making sure I'm doing the right things and, um, yeah, not necessarily socialising. You, you do miss out on that aspect of growing up, but uh, you know what? When you make it to a world champs or an Olympic games, it just feels like it's definitely worthwhile. So yeah, totally. Yeah. So how that would have been like a massive impact, I would imagine, after you quit then, because like suddenly your whole identity and your whole drive is around winning, and then that's no longer there. So ha- what happened in those couple of years, and how did you redirect that? Well, that was a struggle, to be honest. Um, so often I used to uh, watch sports uh, men, especially I'd always notice in like boxing, you'd see these boxers who would be the best boxers in the world and they would retire and they would come back. And I just couldn't understand it. I was thinking, well, why are you, why are you coming back? You're wealthy enough. You've achieved everything. But it is, it's that sort of, that uh, sort of schedule, which is, in set in bed with you it's that sort of wanting to go out there and compete and and prove to either yourself or to the world that you're the best and you you still got the ability to do it so for me it was a massive struggle I that I think my best move was the fact I moved out to Australia as soon as I retired as well uh, because I think if I had stayed around my training group in the UK and, and stayed at home I think I would have probably tried for another year or two so uh, I think it was great that I moved out, but as soon as I moved out and the weather was pretty good, I was thinking, oh, do you know what? One more year, I can eke one more year out of this body. Um, but it was good. I, I managed to get myself uh, uh, a job in, in a field which I really enjoyed. I, I, I loved sciences and I ended up being in the medical uh, sales business. And there was a massive learning curve for me there. So what I did was I really sort of channeled my focus into being as good a salesperson as I can in that new field. Um, And I had to sort of try and create goals and sort of challenges that could sort of compare or or match going to a world championships, which 
was pretty much impossible. So it, it was yeah, so yeah. hard the first couple of years trying to find something to aim and achieve, like going to a world champs or an Olympics. Did you know that about yourself, like before you before you retired from sport? Did you know that about yourself that you have to you knew you had to set goals or did you kind of go oh I'm going to have a break and see what happened and then realize actually I really need to set goals oh I think it was definitely after I retired because yeah. uh, I think you take so many things for granted uh when you're in the moment especially as an athlete uh routine scheduling training the fact you've got physio and tap all these things it just uh, you take for granted and even just your mindset as well that the fact is that I'm wired a certain way and I just expected myself to get up and do what I had to do whenever I had to do it. Mm. And then suddenly when there isn't that requirement to have to do it or you didn't have that big championship to work towards, it was almost like, oh, well, what do I do with myself and how do I get myself motivated to do this? I, I didn't know that that's the way I was wired until when I stopped and it was like, wow, if you don't set that goal, it's not happening. <laughs> so, so yeah, it was a big, that was a, a, a big eye opener. Yeah. I had a little, I had an experience like that as well. Like I've always been a goal setter, you know, like I, for a few, number of years we had a mastermind group and we would like, you know, set our own or do little pieces that we do together. And, uh-huh. and I used to just set seriously, I would have like at least 10 different goals for the year and they would just say, Is that? and I'm like, no, I can just do a bit of that, bit of that, bit of that. Bit of that. And then one year I thought, instead of having like physic like physical achievable goals, I'm gonna have a goal of like a a way of being. Uh-huh. So I was like, this year I'm gonna be integrity, which means all my words and my actions have to be congruent and on the same path. Okay. Seriously, after about three months, I was going nuts. <laughs> I felt like I, I really felt like I was floating. And then, so I went back to setting goals and then a number of years after that, you know, I guess it was, it could have been, I think it was the start of a new relationship. Uh And it was like, it was also like that, that time where I I remember saying to a friend, it's like, I have a a blank canvas and I don't know what to put on it. Mm. And he actually said to me, it was the best advice ever. He said to me, put yourself in the middle and then everything else will come out of that. Okay. And so I really tried to visualize that, but that's kind of when I learned to chill out a bit in terms of goal setting. Okay. You know, when it comes to family and stuff like that, you know, like you go through a different stage of life and, you know, like now I've got lots of kids and I, I literally, I mean, I've had this goal of doing a podcast and, and I have goals at work, but I can't have, I can't have 10 different goals. I just can't achieve them. So <laughs> Oh, yeah, oh. I didn't realise that I was I was a goal setting person until I went. No, I'm not going to set any goals this year, and it drove okay. me totally nuts. And and that's working for you. I, I find for me, if I don't have goals, especially I find it's powerful to write my targets and goals down. Mm-hmm. I find it so hard to achieve them. I really do, you, and I still you have do that. Or you issue. Don't. No, so I do. So I have to write down my goals. Uh, if I it, to give myself the best chance to achieve them, I find I have to write mine down. And, and if I don't, it's so easy not to follow through. Oh, totally. Uh, so um, there is a there is a statistic out there about goal setting. Like actually, you know, like people will say, for example, you know, I want to lose weight, and that's kind of a goal. But mm. if you actually take it from that level into actually writing it down, it's something like it increases your chances of achieving the goal by a thousand times. Oh, really? That yeah. makes sense to me. It totally makes sense it's to me. Total, well. total sense. So. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's really fascinating. So you, you've got this this really m- strong mindset in terms of winning and competing and being your best, and then you got it taken away and you realise that, I really need to have those goals. So you started putting them into place. And so you've, I guess you've directed it more into your career your, in terms of your, well, I guess being an athlete was your career, but in terms of your new career, you've just right. changed it into something that's less physical and more mental. Yeah, very much so. Um, look, so I, I spent, I finished my um, university degree, uh, goodness me, back in 97, uh, seems like a very long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> and um, 
What did it's, you do uh, in? I did biomed. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. So, uh, I, and I love the sciences. So, for me, university was a great period of time. Uh, I probably didn't party as hard as uh, some of my uh, other colleagues, but what it did teach me, it taught me how to learn. And uh, for the first time, uh, I had a great tutor at university. And the first year, he explained to me that, uh, and sort of made me understand that I'm not the kind of person, I can't just read something and memorize it and just regurgitate it. Okay. I am very much, I need to understand the mechanisms. And as soon as I understand the mechanisms, then it's stuck with me. So uh, when I figured this out, and with the help of, uh, as I said, my tutor, I started excelling on that side of things, whereas before I was sort of very much average to below average student. And uh, it allowed me to excel. I did biomed, uh, got a, a two one in my degree. I was really happy with that. Uh, I got some of the best grades I've ever got in my life, in my final years in, in my degree. And it just made me realize that I could actually do that. So mm. Being an international athlete and a world-class athlete, even from a young age, there were times where when I was a lot younger, I didn't really have to train or focus on it, but I was naturally that good. So uh, the requirement for me to really work and focus and get really good at the early stages wasn't, wasn't there. I didn't need to do it. I was blessed with talent at the time, uh, whereas the studying was a completely different uh, thing. So I had to learn that. And so I spent, when I finished my uh, athletics career, uh, I realized I'd have to sort of go back and channel uh, into that sort of learning ability, uh, first with my job in medical sales. And uh, recently, in the last couple of years, I, I did a massive sidestep and uh, went from medical sales to the world of finance, mm -hmm. which is just a completely different language. Um, and to be honest, for the first six to eight months, I thought I'd made a massive mistake because I couldn't understand what people were saying. Um, I had, a, I, and I still do have a really good friend who's my CEO and uh, we went to school together and he just said, look, you're great at sales. I will teach you, uh, the world of finance and you'll be great at that. And, um, in the last year or so, uh, I've just got so much better. And um, that for me, those are huge challenges. And um, that's very mental. You've got to learn it, got to understand it, got to get the confidence that you can stand in front of somebody who's been doing it for 20 years and sell your product without them realizing you've only been doing it for a year or two. So um, it, was, it was challenges like that, which were brilliant. I mean, doing presentations for like national networks for big firms that have been around for donkeys of years um, those kind of things, they got me excited and nervous and sort of ready as if I was getting myself prepared for a World Champs Olympics. So I sort of started setting those kind of goals to go out and do those things, put myself under pressure. Uh, and those just made things a lot more excited and more urgent for me. And I find that I need a level of urgency uh, for me to actually go out there and perform at my best. Yeah, wow, that's so fascinating. Yeah, okay. maybe a little bit crazy too, but <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's um, I can totally see how that's how that's worked for you. And what about your exercise regime now? Oh wow, um, good question. Um, <laughs> I would say that the the year after I retired, I did next to nothing, and probably for the next year as well. Even like stuff like going to the weight room doesn't interest me at all. Yeah, well, it didn't then, um, and. Uh, what I realized is a lot of athletes realize, and, and you see it with a lot of world-class athletes, I just kept on putting on weight year on year. I was getting bigger and bigger, heavier and heavier, and I just felt lethargic. Um, and it was, it was strange. For somebody who's been so fit for so many years of my life, it took me to go out for a run one day, and um, I went for a run, and for the rest of that day, I was like on a high. I mean, an absolute high. And I just thought, nah, it can't be from that run. It's just today has been a good day. And I didn't do it for a couple of days. And then I went for another run and I got the same sensation. And I just thought to myself, this is not a coincidence. <laughs> you need this in your life or it, you just miss out on so much. And um, I'd say probably for the last, so I lost a load of weight probably about three, four years ago. And since then, I just cons I just consistently do training of some kind during the week, and uh, it, and it works for me. But there's no, I wouldn't say I've got a set uh, regime which I follow. Every now and then, I set myself challenges, like be it 
get fit to do something. I, I think a couple of years ago, I um, I coached some junior basketball players, but not in basketball, but just more sort of the plyometrics, the running and the jumping side of things. And there was a young lad who I was coaching and um, I, I told him that I'd be able to dunk in X amount of months. And he was a young guy growing and he was just off dunking. So it was a competition who could dunk first. Uh, and that was a great challenge for me because I had to really train hard. And it, it's stuff like that that I find motivates me. And uh, look, it was it was a great experience to see that I could actually get myself to a certain level of fitness, uh, which I thought had pretty much passed me by. But uh, yeah, I was able to do it. So um, yeah, no, that was good. Awesome. Your kids will start doing that as they get older as well. Oh, they're that challenging me daddy. already. <laughs> so, uh, they're already challenging me, which is good. I mean, um, I'm, I'm happy for them to do whatever sport they want to do, or if they're not feeling sporty, then do whatever they feel they need to do. So I am in no way going to push them towards sports, but uh, they're already showing traits of being quite athletic. So, um, yeah, I'll just let them play as many different sports as they can, and they can choose what they want to do. Yeah. And did you come from a sporting family? Uh, so my parents did both play sport, but not to a very high level. I suppose my parents both grew up in Nigeria. So there was limited opportunities back then when they were growing up. Uh, my mom was a sprinter and she was pretty quick. Wow. Uh, my dad played football quite a lot, uh, soccer, as you guys call it here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, look, both sort of... Uh, both fit and quite sporty people, um, but they were the focus for them definitely wasn't sports for me. It was very much education-wise. Yeah. So I was kind of, in a way, a bit of a rebel on the side that I personally thought, look, I will study and do what study I have to do, but there's no way I'm putting my sporting career on hold at any point. So I just sort of pushed with that. But um, mm-hmm. but yeah, they look. I, they they supported me beyond sort of when I left uni and stuff like that because they felt look you've got your degree now it's pretty much you do what you need to do so that was good yeah it's like you you had your backup plan anyway you could always run with that do you know what and that's good and that was that was very much because of my parents because I think if you'd given me the option uh I won the world junior championships at 19 years old I probably would have had a chance to go all out for an athletics career at that point and not have to go to university uh, but they encouraged me to go to university and they said, look, go to university after that, it's three years, then you've got the rest of your life to pursue this athletics career. And I'm, it's the best move I ever made. I'm so happy I did that. Yeah, uh, and I reckon if it was left to me, I probably would have tried to pursue my athletic career at that point. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, that's what parents are for, huh? To help us make better decisions. Yep, indeed they are. <laughs> it doesn't seem like that at the time, but uh, yeah, <laughs> looking back, it definitely was the right decision. Awesome. Well, just based on um, that generally, how do you reckon, um, you know, how, how are your family going in COVID and all that kind of stuff? Is it, have you, they're all fine and they don't seem too bothered by it or? So uh, I expect there's family here in Australia and there's family in the UK. Um, Look, family here are doing well. I think we've been extremely lucky in Australia. The case numbers are low. I know there's obviously we're having spikes now from the second wave, but uh, it's, it's, um, it's been dealt with pretty well. I mean, here in New South Wales, it's been done, dealt with excellently and they've, they've managed to keep the numbers down. Um, And I just think just because there's a low number of deaths, my kids have not been affected. Homeschooling probably was the toughest thing for all of us. Um, And uh, tough, but also good, because I sort of got to know my kids even better than I I had before, which you you never think. You think you know your kids, and then you have to live with them 24-7 for months. And school them. (laughs) Say that again? Teach them and school them. (laughs) Yeah, no, exactly. And it also was good because it was a big eye-opener for me. I also was able to find out what my kids' strengths and weaknesses were when it came to school and what they liked and what they avoided it if they had to and stuff like that, which was good because then at least we could address that, which is something you just, as a parent, because you're doing everything else to try and sort of support the family and keep everyone... Uh, where they need to be you miss out on a lot of that so um so COVID's been a, a blessing as well as a a, a hindrance um uh, as for my family in the UK I think look we we've been lucky in the sense that uh 
my parents, uh, even though they're quite elderly now, uh, haven't um, they haven't been sick through the period, which is which has just been critical. But I mean, I think there's a lot of people who are going to suffer with a lot of depression back in the UK, mm. just because it's uh, a lot of jobs lost, a lot of people died, and there's still yeah. a lot of people dying now. So they they've still got over a hundred people dying each day, which is if you if you sort of compare that to what's happened in Australia, it's devastating. And this is sort of the better end of the curve. There was points where there was seven, 800 people dying a day, which is just unthinkable. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, yeah, my, I, I'm, I'm happy. And it's good that my um, I have my older brother and my two younger sisters in the UK. So they're there to support my parents because without them there and having my parents all the way over there, this would have been really difficult to be mm-hmm. on the other side of the world and my parents uh, struggling uh, back in the UK. So I've kind of been lucky to have my family around for that period. Yeah. And if you were if you were in the UK, just say, and you were in a situation of lockdown and all that kind of stuff, knowing yourself now, knowing yourself as you are now, would you, do you feel like it, you, or you would, for you to get through it, something like really understanding those characteristics about yourself and like maybe setting some yourself some just different goals that you've never set before at home is the thing that would help you kind of get through it? Without a doubt. I think I would definitely, I think it, it's so hard to stay motivated when things look so bleak and I think that, um, not setting goals would would just make me spiral. What would happen? One thing would go wrong and then something would spiral and something else would go wrong. And if I don't focus on getting out of that spiral, I think it would just be a constant downhill spiral for me. Uh, I, I've been lucky. I've never sort of got to that stage where I'm sort of rock bottom, but I've had friends who I know, close friends, who've had those situations. And, and it, it looks... It looks like a scary situation, a scary state to be in, especially if you haven't got the support around you. So, um, but the other thing I noticed, Larry, is everyone's rock bottom is totally different. Yeah, it's very true. I'm like, you, like my, I, I, the most rock bottom I've had is when I was heartbroken years ago and you came and visited me, which I was always really oh. grateful for. Oh, bless. <laughs> but, you know, relative to other people's rock bottom, it was like mm-hmm. I was feeling heartbroken and I had to work my way through it, you know, like, but other people's rock bottom, people get really stuck and they don't know mm. how to get themselves out of it. And I think that's because they don't understand themselves. So, you know, like if people can take a message out of this, if you actually understand yourself and your characteristics and what motivates you to just get up every day and do the things that you love, if you can tap into that and work with that, your rock bottom doesn't have to be as low. And that's not like taking it away from people that do really struggle and and people do need support. But if you can start to understand those aspects of yourself and work with them, you know, it can really just help you come out of those patterns and and look at them from a better a better place i i, I totally agree i i think you're you're spot on with that and, and it and it is so true i i think that you're right with the different levels and sometimes it only takes you from getting from your bottom level to the next level up to actually for you to see a bit of light at the end mm-hmm. of the tunnel yeah. uh, and i i think that you're, you're spot on in the sense that if you're able to to take that one step it is a massive help and it could only require that one step. And then if you've got the support around you, they can pull you out. But I tend to find that the, the actual person themselves has to be able to take that one step to get that journey started. Um, and uh, that one step might be go get help or it might be exactly. you know, go do some exercise or it might be call someone that you need to call or whatever that one step is yep. and then get the support to take the next steps. But it is like you know, it, it is up to the individual. It's like, you know, if people come in and see me as a practitioner, like they've taken the step to come and see me. So half the half my job's done. Uh-huh. That's but right. if someone books another family member for them to come in and see me, like they actually haven't taken the step yet. That's it. They haven't got the ownership of that. Right. And or often they don't. That momentum. Don't up. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah, it is. I, I totally agree. But, yeah, that's a, um, I think that's a really great place to round up the conversation. And, and um, thank you so much for your time today. It's been wonderful talking to you again. Thank you. It is great to have caught up again. <laughs> and thank you so much for inviting me on your podcast. That's okay. Do you have, do you, I don't know if you're in, if you want people to contact you, if they need finance advice or 
if you're on social media or, or you don't have to, but you're welcome. Oh, to. look, you follow my LinkedIn page. Uh, uh, I work for a company called uh, ETF Securities. We deal with exchange traded funds. I'm constantly posting uh, uh, information on the market and what I've learned on that on my LinkedIn site. Okay. Uh Feel free to contact us at ETF Securities uh, Australia. Um, we've got a great sales team. I'm part of uh, a, a, a team which is well, team sales teams around about six people, all happy to help and support in any way we can. Awesome. Thanks so much, Larry. Have a Have great a day. Thank you so much, Sarah. Have a lovely day. If you loved or learnt something in this episode, share it and don't forget to subscribe. I look forward to bringing you next week's Awakening Conversation. Have a wonderful week.